so my first question for you, Kev, well, is uh, if an alien were to uh, drop in on this conversation, uh, how would you identify yourself? How would you introduce yourself to this alien life form? <laughs> um, that is a hard one. Does this, does this alien understand um, human language? Yes. Okay. I probably would say, I would give my name a point to myself, give my name Cadwell. Wait, go ahead and do it. Like you do it. Imagine, um, I'm the I'm the alien. I'm Cadwell. And um, I'm, I would say that I'm a storyteller. It would depend on how much context the alien has about human culture. Like, does the alien know about writers? What a writer is? I think you just, you don't know. You're just going to have to go with you. Don't know what the alien knows about you or doesn't. Okay. I'm Cadwell. I'm a storyteller. Primarily. And um, soon to be a teacher. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think that's great. <laughs> um, that's totally great. So what, you're in, uh, you're in Boston, right? Yes, Somerville. So right, right next to Boston. Yeah, just in the Boston area. Yeah. All right, and then you have a lot to tell on this, I know. But how how have you been spending your time? Or you know, Malakia asked this great question: How are you keeping your peace these days? I kind of like that. Um. So in the mornings, I have um, a writing group. There's a couple other writers um, that I work with we just get on camera and we do our own work and we talk a little bit about what we're working on and some of the questions that we have and some of the challenges that we're having in the writing but for the most part it's just us sitting and writing in the same space if that makes sense um but that's that's part coping like it it helps me get work done to have someone uh, a group of people there working as well um, and so the, it gives me like a, a good start to my morning. Um, in the afternoons, sometimes I'll continue doing writing or reading, um, or I'll watch film, um, which is which has been a good coping mechanism for me: watching films, watching TV, playing playing online Catan, which is a um, board game, but there's like a a, a version on the Switch where you can play with people all over the world. And so I play Catan with people that I don't know. Wow. Huh. That's what I do for the most part. Don't really leave the house much. So that's that's what I have. My wife runs. She she goes on and she does runs and walks in the morning for a couple hours. Now you you were sick early on with COVID like condition and you weren't able to get diagnosed right mm -hmm. covid like symptoms i don't know what it was um and we weren't able to get testing and since i'm for the most part better now um i'm not really a priority and so i haven't really looked into it recently whether or not i should go get the test i i figure Eventually, when they're doing more, um, they're testing more broadly for antibodies. I'll go and see if I have COVID antibodies, and then I'll know for sure. But it was, I'm still not 100% over it, but for like about a month, I had COVID symptoms. Difficulty breathing, um, mucus buildup, yeah. uh, weakness in the joints, chills, um, all of that stuff. A mild fever. That must have been a little scary. I, mean, I don't know. How did it feel? I should ask. It's so for the most part, I would say I would I had mild symptoms. I wasn't really that bad. It was like a day, a solid day where I had difficulty breathing, yeah. um, and it was that was really scary because I was like, this could be the worst it gets, or it could be. A cascade it could get worse than this and that whole day i was it was not just the difficulty breathing but the, the anxiety 
of not knowing how far I was going to progress. And I was already feeling like um, the hospitals must be over, over, um, overexerted at that point. And it would be, you know, it would just be a, a really difficult time. And so I, I, when not knowing if I needed to go to the hospital or if I would have to eventually need to go to the hospital was, was nerve wracking. And then having the difficulty breathing and um, not being able to move around and be mobile the way I would want to, you know, the helpless feeling, that feeling of helplessness, like you kind of like, you know, I was stuck at home. So just feeling like I couldn't do anything about it. And normally if it was like normal times, if I was feeling that sick, I would, I would be able to go to the hospital and that would be like a thing that wouldn't be also, there's a pandemic and the hospitals are like, you know, overexerted and all of those things thinking about, it's, you know, difficult. You're muted, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Have you seen anything inspiring as it relates to cooperation and solidarity economy during this period? Um. I wish that I was keeping up with things as much as I should be. It's been kind of um, difficult on my end, but I have I have noticed that people, I do like go on Twitter a lot and I notice that people are being supportive of each other. There's a lot of like people having conversations about ways to cope during this crisis and um, reaching out to each other, just checking in. Just, you know, a lot of people just being just really caring and compassionate. Um, and it's also been, you know, this, this situation has allowed me to reach out to family more. I've been talking to um, my mom every day. And I've been talking to, you know, friends and I've talked to my brother and my sister more regularly. Um, and that's been really good um been doing things with people that I normally would do by myself so like I um my best friend from back home recently we we both recently lost a friend that we grew up with um and he he was um a TSA agent in in Atlanta and he contracted the virus and he oh, yeah wow and so we've been kind of coping with that loss through watching t um, a TV show together. We've been watching um, Ozark together and just talking about it and, you know, making jokes and, you know, having conversations before and after. And that, that in a lot of ways has helped us to kind of move through, move through this um, difficult time. And I've just been like um, recently, a someone through you actually connected with me about doing like a co-op story like co-op gameplay storytelling thing and so and it hasn't started yet but it's something that i'm excited about and it has to do with solidarity and so um, yeah that's been exciting i wonder you know in your uh story the lesson right you it seems like you find kind of lessons or ideas for solidarity economy in the aftermath of the hurricane. Um, do you feel like there's something, any kind of similar dynamic in this uh, pandemic? I think that a lot of the stuff that's been happening, it's, it's virtual for now. Um, but I think that coming out of this, there's going to be a lot more um, work towards creating the stability that we we now know we lack so there's a lot of ways that the system that we've come to trust has been tested by this and there was always vulnerable people and we were all already vulnerable um some some people didn't know how much they were vulnerable um hmm. but this has really been a wake-up call i think for a lot of people and it's i think there is going to be a response to that 
which will be beneficial to the cooperative movement. I think people are going to come together and try to figure out, well, if we can't trust um, our administrations, um, our systems, our companies and corporations to, to make sure that we're okay, what can we do for ourselves to make sure that we're okay? And what can we do for each other as community to make sure that we're okay? I just realized I was confusing your novel, The Lesson, right? With the short story. Uh, yeah, the monsters come howling in their season. That's yeah, that's it. That's what I was thinking. Because they... this was this is definitely a monster that came howling. Right, right, right. Yeah, in the story, it's a hurricane. And, well, it's, it's climate change. Um, the hurricanes in the Caribbean are yeah. like, are more severe and there's um there's a lot that the community has to do in order to make sure that they, that you know the island is still livable and also right. that there's minimal damage and then when there is damage that there's resources available to to make the recovery more expedient so in this case you see the sort of similar kind of test of the system and realizing wait a minute we're not ready like we're not we, we weren't prepared for this yeah I, it's a similar thing yeah it i think that we were never ready um and there was a lot of there's a lot of belief and you know there's still a lot of people that still don't believe anything's happening or they're not taking it seriously i know there's a movement in the united states at least of um people asking for the economy for people to go back to work and the economy to open back up mm. Mm. um uh, but I think that that also is a symptom of the fact that we we just we're just not really a cohesive um, country. We're not we're not together on the things we should be together on. And I'll, we're going to be asking ourselves some really hard questions. But I also think we're going to be um, and we've already started having conversations with each other and trying to figure out how we can support each other. So do you see any, uh, our last question is, can you describe a fruitful change, like one fruitful change related to cooperation in the solidarity economy that you think might come out of the pandemic? So it doesn't have to be something you've seen happening yet, but a possibly emerging positive uh, development for cooperation and solidarity economy. This is where your speculative talents <laughs> come up. Like, is there, is there any what, something that has come up that you think, oh, this could come out of this? There could be some positive direction. Um, so talking about it generally, I have been paying attention to progressive media. Um, mm -hmm. I've been reading a lot of the progressive, like um, newspapers, magazines, and um, there's a couple YouTubers I follow that are also like um, progressives. And what I've been seeing or what I've been noticing a lot more of, especially among like, um, like um, progressive social media and progressive um, YouTube is people talking, these, these, um, these people are talking more to activists, grassroots activists. They're having more conversations with movement people and asking like how do we create a movement and some of this is due to like you know we just came out of a election i i think a lot of people feel like the primary is over you know um we've decided who are who the democratic nominee is mm -hmm. but you know a lot of people are feeling a little bit um disillusioned because they had put their bets on sanders or they put them their bets on some other progressive and that's not who they're getting and this is coming out of 2016 when they were putting the, a lot of their faith in a revolution as well. And so a lot of these people are talking to like um, union activists and um, um, grassroots activists. And I think we're gonna see, I haven't seen it yet, but we're gonna see people talking to cooperative activists. And there's gonna be, I think there's gonna be a, um, a uptick in grassroots media there's going to be a lot more cooperative media and i think that it's going to be both on the non-fiction side and the and on fiction side that's great that's my hope at least yeah. 
Yeah, um, and that's something you're going to be part of, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I'd like to be. Yeah, definitely. All right. I think this is great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.